Okay, welcome back. I apologize for that, but we are refocused now. So let me go ahead and pick up where we left off. So what we have here is a cranial nerve, uh, and we mentioned that parasympathetic pathways tend to come out of cranial nerves. And in fact, most parasympathetic pathways, not all, but most parasympathetic pathways come out of the same cranial nerve. In this case, this is the vagus nerve which is cranial nerve number 10. So many, many, many parasympathetic pathways tend to come out of cranial nerves, most of which make up the, uh, the vagus nerve. Uh, some exceptions to this rule is that some parasympathetic pathways will come out of the bottommost or most sacral part of the spinal cord down here, but not in this example that we're looking at here. So this is a nice thing to remember because anywhere from the lower part of the lumbar spinal cord up to the very top, up till the upper part of the cervical spinal cord, you're not going to find any parasympathetic pathways. Parasympathetic pathways, if they're not coming through cranial nerves, they're coming out through the bottom most, most sacral part of the spinal cord. Okay, so moving right along here, we've got our vagus nerve. It is carrying the axon of this parasympathetic motor neuron. So what you might expect is that you might expect, since our target that we are trying to communicate with is the heart, you might expect that this axon is going to go all the way to the heart and it is going to directly release neurotransmitter onto the heart so that we can uh, modulate the function of the heart in some way. Well, that's not exactly true. So if we finish drawing this pathway here, going all the way out here, we're getting close to the heart, but before we get to the heart, draw its axon terminal right there, before we get to the heart, this parasympathetic neuron is going to synapse on another neuron. So I'll draw its cell body right here. Okay, and this neuron is then going to be the one that directly synapses on the heart itself. So this is one of the most common things for us to talk about when we're discussing the autonomic nervous system. What we're used to at this point is that we're used to motor neurons existing just in uh, singles, right? So a motor neuron extends its axon all the way to its target. It turns out that's usually only the case when your target is skeletal muscle. If you have an autonomic target, like cardiac muscle, which is what we've got here, smooth muscle, glandular tissue, things that are not voluntarily controlled, your setup of motor neurons is going to come in pairs like this. And we have words to describe this. The first neuron that comes out through the cranial nerve here is called the preganglion, excuse me, preganglionic neuron. And then the second one here is called the postganglionic. So it, the terminology here is similar to presynaptic and postsynaptic, which we covered in uh, the first chapter on the nervous system. So preganglionic, postganglionic. The reason why we use those terms is because this structure right here, the way I have it drawn, it's just one single cell body. The reality is that it's actually multiple cell bodies all congregated in the same place. And you guys will remember, we have terminology that we use to describe clusters of cell bodies that are all together. In the central nervous system, we call that a nucleus. Out here in the peripheral nervous system, we call this a ganglion. Specifically, this is a parasympathetic ganglion. I'll abbreviate that there. So here is the interesting thing about 
parasympathetic pathways. You'll notice that the preganglionic neuron extends pretty far out and it almost gets to the heart. So the preganglionic neuron has a very long axon and then because the postganglionic neuron, its cell body is already situated pretty close to the target, it doesn't need to have a very long axon, so its axon ends up being a little bit short. So this is actually pretty typical of parasympathetic pathways. Your parasympathetic ganglia tend to be situated either very close to their target glands or effectors, or in many cases, they're literally right on top of them so that... Again, the preganglionic axon ends up being very long. The postganglionic one ends up being very short. Okay, so very quickly here, let us switch gears. I've got my red pen, so we are now going to discuss sympathetic pathways. Sympathetic pathways, as opposed to parasympathetic pathways, sympathetic pathways never come through cranial nerves. They always, always, always come through spinal nerves. Typically we see them come out of the thoracic part of the spinal cord here. So I'm drawing lots of cell bodies of sympathetic preganglionic neurons. I'm going to pick one right here. And this being our preganglionic neuron here, what you're going to notice about the way I draw this is it's going to look a lot different than our parasympathetic pathway. So with this one, I'm drawing the preganglionic axon here, and then I'm going to draw its axon terminal right there. So there is our autonomic ganglion right there, and then it is going to extend its axon, our postganglionic axon, all the way to our effector, which again is the heart. Okay. There we go. So you see kind of the opposite here. You see we have our preganglionic right there. And then this is our postganglionic axon right here. So once again, we have the preganglionic, postganglionic setup, but the length of the axons is kind of flipped as compared to our parasympathetic pathway that we looked at previously. So in sympathetic pathways, which again come out of the spinal cord, usually the thoracic side, preganglionic axons tend to be very short. The postganglionic axon tends to be very long, and this is because for this structure right here, which is our sympathetic ganglion, sympathetic ganglia tend to be pretty close to the spinal cord. In fact, uh, if you check the anatomy, there is actually a big chain, a big vertically running chain parallel to the length of the spinal cord, a big chain of these ganglia that help to connect preganglionic neurons to their effectors. So at this point, what we've covered is we've covered the relative lengths of axons of both parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways, and then we've also covered where those preganglionic neurons tend to make their exit from the central nervous system. Again, sympathetic tend to come out of the middle or thoracic part of the spinal cord. Parasympathetic usually are going to come out through cranial nerves. Usually that's the vagus nerve. But if they don't, then you're going to be talking about the most sacral part of the spinal cord, the very bottom of it right there. So the last thing for us to review here is the neurotransmitters that we are using. And this is a very important topic for us to discuss here. So look at this picture that we've got right here. So count the number of neurons that are involved in just this one pathway. So if we count them up, we've got one, two, three, and four. So we've got four different neurons that are involved in the dual innervation of the heart.
So what that means for neurotransmitters is that Theoretically speaking, we could be using up to four different neurotransmitters. And if that were the case, that would make our lives really hard. It would make this kind of unnecessarily complicated. So the good news is we don't need four different neurotransmitters. But this is very important. We do need at least two different neurotransmitters. And where we need those two different neurotransmitters is the neurotransmitter that is released from the post-ganglionic neurons here. So think about it this way. This is a thought experiment I always like my students to do. Look at those two post-ganglionic neurons. Your pre-ganglionic one here, your, uh, or excuse me, your parasympathetic one here, your sympathetic one right here. Imagine that they are both releasing the same neurotransmitter. So just for the sake of argument, say they're both releasing acetylcholine. Think about it for a second. If both are releasing acetylcholine, would it be possible for them to elicit different effects on the heart? Keeping in mind, parasympathetic activity is going to lower your heart rate. Sympathetic activity is going to raise your heart rate. We've got two different pathways that are both meant to do opposite things, can they do opposite things if they're both releasing the same neurotransmitter? And the answer is no. The heart is saturated with receptors for different neurotransmitters, and if they're both using the same neurotransmitter, you're going to get the same response. So if we want a parasympathetic path, yeah, a parasympathetic pathway to lower the heart rate, we have to use one type of neurotransmitter for that. And if we want the sympathetic pathway to raise your heart rate, well, we have to use a unique neurotransmitter to, for that. And it just so happens that on the parasympathetic side, the neurotransmitter we're going to use to lower the heart rate is acetylcholine. Our most common neurotransmitter that we have and will talk about. On the sympathetic side, we cannot use acetylcholine. We are instead going to use norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. So this heart tissue here actually has two different types of receptors. For the acetylcholine, it's got muscarinic receptors which is a type of acetylcholine receptor. And for the norepinephrine, we've got alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, mostly the beta. So I'll underline that right there. Now, it's worth mentioning that these alpha and beta receptors do not just respond to norepinephrine, they also respond to epinephrine. Epinephrine is not a neurotransmitter, though. It is a hormone that is released by, do you remember? By the adrenal medulla. The release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla is actually a part of a neuroendocrine response that is facilitated by the sympathetic nervous system. So when your sympathetic fight or flight response gets into overdrive, not only do you activate a purely neural response like this, but you also activate a hormonal response and you can kind of double down on your response. Your heart rate will go up because of the norepinephrine that is attacking the same receptors that epinephrine from the blood is doing as well. So acetylcholine is going to be your uh, neurotransmitter that we use for parasympathetic responses. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to be the neurotransmitter and hormone that are going to facilitate uh, sympathetic responses. So the last thing to kind of finish up here is we've also got neurotransmitter being released by our preganglionic neurons. So the type of neurotransmitter you use here really does not matter quite as much, but to make things nice and simple for us, it's going to be acetylcholine in both cases. And this acetylcholine will actually bind to nicotinic receptors.
on the autonomic ganglia. And because nicotinic receptors are always excitatory, when you get a message coming from a preganglionic neuron, you are always going to excite and stimulate the postganglionic neuron as well. Now, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine may or may not be excitatory or inhibitory. In this particular case, and you'll want to read up on this, uh, acetylcholine would actually be a inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's using a muscarinic receptor, which we've said before, you're not always going to know whether a muscarinic is excitatory or inhibitory. You need to know what type of ion channel you're opening. In this case, you're opening a potassium channel. So you are hyperpolarizing the heart, uh, the uh, autorhythmic parts of the heart, the SA node, etc. You're making action potentials harder to get, so your heart rate goes down because it takes a little bit longer to get yourself up to threshold there. Epinephrine and norepinephrine will be excitatory here. They will get the heart, uh, the autorhythmic parts of the heart excited so that heartbeats happen more frequently because you are getting closer and closer to threshold in a much quicker manner. So to sum up what we've talked about here, we've talked about three major topics. We've talked about parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways. How do they like to come out of the central nervous system? Cranial nerves or sometimes sacral spinal nerves for the parasympathetic. Thoracic spinal nerves for the sympathetic. We've talked about the lengths of axons as it pertains to preganglionic versus postganglionic fibers. And then we've also talked about our choice of neurotransmitters. So that'll do it for this video. This is not the only thing that you'll want to study for the autonomic nervous system, but this is a very quick and hopefully good review of some of the most important topics. So I will see you next time. Uh, see you later.